there was a yearning for a family of my own uh, because I lost my mother when I was nine and never really had a family. I was in a boarding school, later joined a monastery. But that yearning for family was quite strong, so that was the main reason I left. But, you know, once I made the decision to leave, it was very difficult to um, sort of, you know, sort out uh, how my, the, the nature of my relationship with His Holiness with, might change. Um, so, of course, there was a year or two when I was going through the decision process, it was a very painful experience. and and. Not just His Holiness, but also my own monastic colleagues, uh, because I was fairly senior in the monastic community, and I had many students in the monasteries. And the question for me was, how do I present the case in a way that people can understand this is a purely personal reason, and my leaving the monast monastic life doesn't represent any form of disillusionment of the system and the monastic tradition as a whole. That was the crucial um, thing. But His Holiness, of course, took it very wisely. And looking back, it's not surprising. Uh, he was um, very understanding. And he, the first time I met him as a lay person, um, as I walked into the room, I apologized to him, turning up in trousers, not in robes. And he, imme he immediately kind of joked, saying, oh, you always had a rather large head on a short body, but now your head looks even bigger with the hair, you know. So he immediately broke the ice and uh, he was very compassionate. He said, of course I'm saddened to lose someone like you from the monastic community. But on the other hand, he said, I've known you for some time and you don't take decisions like this lightly. So uh, I respect your decision. In important relationships, um, there will be moments and quite frequent, you know, not just infrequent, when one side will be feeling quite low. And at those moments, it's very important for the other partner to rise up and be magnanimous. Even if the person who's feeling vulnerable is in the wrong, it's not the right time to remind them that they are making a mistake. So that's one very important point I realized, because His Holiness could have scolded me and said, you know, this is embarrassing, what were you thinking, you know, what would the other junior monks, you know, learn from this example, you know, all of that could come later, but he didn't do that immediately. <laughs> and that, I think, made a huge difference. So this is something, you know, I, there was an important lesson, and I tried to bring it in my own intimate relationship with my wife, you know, um, relationship is a two-way dance, and, uh, you know, often, you know, you have to choose the right moment to say the right thing. And I actually invented this line that it's not enough to be right. You have to be right at the right time. <laughs> you know, the difference between a monastic and a family person is a monastic, although we live in a community, um, there is a level beyond which you, you don't have an intimate relationship with another person. So. Monks have their teachers, you know, you live, you're kind of very self-reliant and you learn to be very autonomous in your need. Um, so beyond a certain level of intimacy, you don't need to open up, which also means you are less vulnerable as a person. One thing I realized is that in a couple, you know, in an ideal couple, you would want your partner to be absolutely equal, which means you, you would want your partner to be your best friend in whose presence you don't have to put on any, any show. You know, in whose presence you can be just yourself with all the faults and all the strengths and everything, which, you know, which demands a level of openness in that intimate relationship. And initially that was a tough one for me because I grew up as a monk. I grew up to, you know, kind of emotionally be more independent. And then as a parent, one thing that I was very impressed by the parenting experience is that, you know, when your children are small and they're screaming their head off, I was surprised that as parents, how much patience and understanding you, you tend to have. Because I think it, it probably has something to do with the biology that 
I'm sure the parents' brains are different when the children are small, so that we don't expect children to understand everything. So when the children are throwing tantrums and your child is throwing tantrums and kicking and screaming, you are just there waiting for the whole kind of, you know, excited energy to calm down. <laughs> Genuine compassion really has to be a moment where your focus is just the other and your concern is ultimately about the other person. And parents, particularly of young children, have that experience powerfully. I think if I were a monk, I will have to just simulate through meditation. But as parents, you get those just real raw, you know. <laughs> One can be very self-critical and self-judging, but at the same time be compassionate towards others. There are many examples, people who are very altruistic, dedicate their life in service, uh, but at the personal level, they are very harsh on themselves, and as well as their own intimate family members. You know, they can be out there saving the world, but when it comes to treating your own, you know, inner circles or in family members, you're kind of quite nasty. This happens. But one thing that is important and increasingly, actually, science is showing us is that if you don't have at least some reserve of self-compassion, then your reserve to be able to be available to be kind to others is not very long lasting, not very enduring. And at some point you get a burnout. Whereas if you take care of your own needs, you know, if you have a quite a healthy self to self relation, a kind of a, a natural ability to be kind to yourself, to understand your needs, as well as take care of it. And especially when you are confronted with a failure, you are able to stand up. If you are able to do this, then you have a real reserve of compassion, which then will be much more available to others on a much more sustained basis. And that is what is happening, because sometimes what happens is people who don't take care of their own needs and their own need for self-kindness they're always other focused. At some point, they get burnout and they start feeling bitter towards the people who, for whom they have dedicated their life. So it's getting that balance right is key. Yeah, I think generally, um, and this may come as a surprise, um, Western nations tend to be more compassionate than the Asian nations. Uh, and as an Asian, I can say that. And the reason why I say this is when there are global crises like Asian tsunami or uh, um, Haiti, you know, uh, floods. Um, the level of giving, not just by the government, and because at the government level one can say the Western governments are much more affluent, they're rich, but at the individual level the giving is much higher. In the continental Europe and particularly in Nordic countries like uh, Scandinavia and Netherlands, as a society, a choice has been made. We value a more equitable structure. So this demands that people who are on the more fortunate end of the spectrum need to pay a bit more in terms of tax so that there's a little redistribution. And it's also no coincidence when you know, surveys are done, the self-report of happiness is much higher in these countries because you have a sense of empathy for your fellow citizens and you would want there to be some safety net. So whether society values compassion collectively or not has a huge implications in the lives of millions of people who are living in these societies. I would argue what we see in America with the rise of white nationalism, um, to a large extent, it's a consequence of an economic system which overemphasizes individual autonomy and choice and reduction of tax, taxation, which means as a state, at the collective level, there's no resources to redistribute. So then that leads to a, a societal system where people start thinking that, you know, if so, someone is unsuccessful, then it is his fault or he's lazy. He's you know, he's not trying hard. Sad. He's a loser. You know, if I'm successful, you know, it's my right, you know, and I've taken the opportunity, which may be true, but because you don't take compassion collectively seriously, then you don't have the language 
all the culture within which arguments can be made for more equitable structure of the society. And that has huge consequences because increasingly as digitization and automation of many of the labors increase, employment is going to be an issue. Yes. So I think this is the direction the world is moving in. So taking compassion seriously and particularly embracing at the societal level really has a huge implication.